This time of COVID has reminded us how important it is to care for each other, especially for the elderly and the most vulnerable. Furthermore, it has forced us to understand that sometimes limiting certain individual liberties may be necessary for the common good. However, here in Canada, medical assistance in dying, which was decriminalized in 2016, is under consideration for expansion. Bill C-7, as it is called, was reintroduced in Parliament on October 5th, and if it passes, it might mean that most of the safeguards that were deemed necessary in 2016 would be removed. And so to help us understand this a little better, I'm now joined by Bishop William McGratton. He's representing the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. He's the Bishop of Calgary, and uh, also Dr. Moira McQueen of the Canadian Catholic Bioethics Institute. Welcome, both of you. It's good to have you with us today. Thank you, Pedro. Um, Dr. McQueen, let me start with you. If you can help us understand a little bit of what the current legislation says. What are the current safeguards that we have uh, for medical assistance in dying in Canada? Yes, right. When the legislation was introduced, then safeguards were in place, safeguards that many people thought were a little bit shaky at the time. But mm -hmm. they, at that point, said that somebody who was suffering from a debilitating illness, actually Parliament added disability at that point, uh, and there was no cure, that kind of thing, then they could apply to be assessed for medical assistance in dying. And so the assessment had to be done by two medical practitioners. Mm -hmm. And then if the person was found eligible, then there would be a 10 day waiting period until the person, uh, in case the person changed his or her mind. And then, then at the very end of the 10 days, the person had to consent again to have the procedure done. And mm -hmm. it was very clear that that consent involved somebody who was sane, who was in a fit state to give that consent. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are two important safeguards. And, and you mentioned that we, there were objections at the time, Bishop McGratton, would you say that even then, the Conference of Catholic Bishops would have objected to the legislation as it was presented five years ago? Yes, that's true. As, as it was presented, uh, the Catholic bishops made statements uh, to the government and opposed it vehemently. We also pointed out, you know, the euphemistic uh, language that was used in the bill itself, you know, uh, referring to assisted suicide and euthanasia as medical assistance in dying. But as Dr. Moira McQueen mentioned, um, we, I think, realized that these safeguards were there to try and protect the vulnerable. They also stated at the time that they weren't going to make any changes for the first five years and allow for that experience to then inform them of a review. And here they are now introducing and expanded um, amendments to this legislation. So. It's, it's very troubling, it's disconcerting, and, and really the bishops continue to be opposed to uh, physician-assisted suicide. Right. Maybe before we talk about the changes, since you brought it up, Bishop, um, Dr. McQueen, can you explain why is the government proposing this expansion now? Well, again, it's because uh, the court is, has pushed the, the ball into Parliament's court, so to speak, and the same thing had happened before. It was a court case, the Carter case, that brought matters to a head. And the Supreme Court said, you know, they would they would sort of dispose of that particular piece of legislation, the part that was against uh, Lillian Carter's liberty of the person, unless Parliament did something about it and the government did respond with legislation. And, and of course, Bishop McGrattan is right, the government said five years would pass, but they've actually had two separate commissions since uh, the, the passing of the legislation to discuss a few issues. And again, with the Truchon decision in the Quebec court, then the decision again has been made by Parliament to bring this legislation forward. So they, they haven't kept their words about the five years and some people would say that even the lack of thorough review is a problem even at this stage as well. Right, so you mentioned the Truchon case, so that's a, a Quebec uh, court that, that because of a specific case, uh, I guess legislated that the government add uh, a particular change that has to do with with whether the death is foreseeable or not. Yeah. Um, that's one of the changes. So why don't we start there then, that safeguard that the death has to be a natural foreseeable death. 
Um, what is the proposed change? To well, I, again, I think I used to say in 2016 that one didn't have to be a lawyer to recognize that reasonably foreseeable was such a vague term that it had to have been included in the legislation almost deliberately because it's vague, knowing that it would be challengeable in the future. And that's what's happened in, in this with the Truchon case, again, bringing it to, to a head. So the, it's so difficult, of course, to have terminology like reasonably foreseeable. What does reasonably mean? Everybody's death is foreseeable, but reasonably is another problem. Right. And the Truchon case uh, made us really begin to reconsider, um, since it, it cannot really be established, and since there would always be a possibility that a person wouldn't be able to still be able to give consent, that that part um, would be just uh, disposed of. And so the foreseeability part, assuming the person was compass mentis at the time, would just be written off. And so that that particular safeguard, even if it were a little bit flawed, it was still a safeguard, but that one is being disposed of, at least it is proposed that it will be disposed of completely. So to be clear then, the proposal is that the death does not have to be foreseeable I can have any condition that is maybe not terminal, but I can well, still make well, a request. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it, even from the beginning, uh, if we go back and look at the legislation uh, from 2016, the word terminal isn't included in, mm -hmm. in the legislation. So it was severe illness, uh, that kind of approach. And I, I think it was really intended to be for something serious. I don't question that. Yeah. But the word terminal was definitely ruled out. When they introduced the word disability, people knew then that disabilities aren't any more terminal than you know than than anything else. So it was a strange, um, strange to me, a strange use of terminology in a clause that was meant to be a safeguard. Yeah. So I'm not really that surprised that it's one of the ones that would be you know proposed that it be eliminated now. And Bishop McGrattan, I would think that as Catholics, I mean, our understanding of suffering and death is maybe a little different than the understanding that the secular world has. What would you tell people who are having difficulty with this idea that it, people who have a terminal foreseeable death, that that, that, that that has been proven, and I know that that's maybe one of the changes that will be made, but that struggle with, with that idea that we should have certain autonomy over our own, uh, our own suffering and death? Well, that seems to be the current uh, thinking and approach to this. Um, I think that the Catholic Church and those who are Christians and believe in the dignity of the human person, we can't define ourselves just by the circumstances of our life. There's, there's always a sense of an inherent dignity. And when people find themselves in situations, maybe medical conditions, maybe socio or economic, those don't necessarily define them. And so we need to be providing more support uh, more care, and this is why the call for um, a palliative care, the need for understanding that people are vulnerable, and so sometimes they are forced into situations where they don't think that they're going to have that support and care, or they feel that they're a burden to others. So these become some of the natural uh, kind of human emotions that people associate with this particular issue. Mm -hmm. For us as Christians as well, you know, uh, suffering has a redemptive value, and I know that that's part of our lived faith, but it's often very difficult existentially when we experience that in our own lives. But when we can enter into it with a deep faith, then this becomes possibly the opportunity for individuals and families to be drawn into a, 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 an experience of love, of care, of compassion, that's the very presence of God that becomes the, the human manifestation of that in the world. So that becomes for us as, as Christians, I think, the appropriate and necessary response. Mm -hmm. And that's why we don't see that assisted suicide and euthanasia is not the choice and the option that we want Canadians to have. We want them to have a diverse option that respects the dignity of human beings. We can't demand suffering of people but we can associate and help and to assist them in those vulnerable moments of their life, whether it's foreseeable death, whether it's people with chronic illness. Uh, many people face suffering in various ways, hidden, and I think we as Canadians need to protect the most vulnerable.
Right, and, 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 and death is not the way to solve the suffering. And I do want to talk about palliative care uh, shortly, um, but he also made me think of the whole irony of, and which is what I said with the introduction, that we're being told on one side that we need to care for each other, care for the elderly, COVID, limit you know, certain individual liberties, and then at the same time, we're being told that, well, no, maybe this is how we need to care for each other, by uh, you know, administering death to them. Um, so one of the safeguards that's being removed, uh, Dr. McQueen, as you said, is the, 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 that foreseeable death, the need f uh, for that to be there. Um, you also mentioned uh, earlier about that reflection period, the 10-day reflection period. Why is that important, and why do, are we concerned that it would be removed? Well, I, I think uh, in so many situations, we have really been learning over the years that people make decisions, uh, Bishop McGrath has pointed out, uh, some of the situations in which we find ourselves, when we, in fact, we maybe do contract a serious illness, there are definite levels of depression and loneliness and all the different aspects of our own pers personalities, really, our own psyche that can really uh, color the decisions that we make. And that freedom, that moral freedom that we really need to make really good decisions can sometimes be covered over because of that. And that's why any, any suggestion that somebody who is suffering from depression or any other form of mental illness is, is such a concern for people. Because just, just talking legally, not even from a sort of Catholic moral perspective, the idea of giving proper consent is absolutely fundamental in, in a country like Canada. It's demanded in every other situation. And consent has to be uncoerced, it has to be full, it has to be freely given. And there are so many situations, I think, where it's a real concern that that maybe is not happening. In fairness, the, the government before gave 10 days, but 10 days is not actually an awfully long period of time, for, especially for serious conditions. And in this new legislation, if you don't mind my still talking about it, they're talking about a 90-day period uh, in terms of you know, getting rid of the reasonably foreseeable uh, death. So in a longer period, but many physicians have pointed out that the length it can take for somebody to recover from a, a really serious illness, which can sometimes lead people to thinking they would be better off dead, but the, the, the treatment itself may take some time long beyond something like 90 days. And if it's, a, if it's a mental condition that could be treated, it sometimes does take longer than 90 days. So these, I think the time periods are arbitrary. I really don't understand you know, exactly why they're fixed upon it. They maybe seem to be reasonable, but I think there is certainly questions about uh, that, that kind of approach. Right, and to Bishop McGratton's point earlier about palliative care, um, sometimes you might you might need psychiatric care, but that's not available to you for maybe a year, depending on how you know the, the, where you live in in the country. Um, but then in 90 days, you can still um, uh, have medical assistance in dying. That's such an important point, which many okay. of the physicians have been pointing out. That so it's not just uh, the person himself or herself taking long, needing to take a longer time to really think these things through, but the availability of the very treatment that people, you know, need, if, if that's not there, then that, that there already has been a situation where one, one man opted for medical assistance in dying because mm -hmm. the, the treatment that he needed wasn't forthcoming. And so we're, we're really doing a disservice to Canadians, actually, people in any country, if there is an offer of uh, made, uh, and at the same time, we talk about our health care system and how good it is, but we're really not giving people the full option of treatments that could be available, and I would be saying should be available in terms of somebody making a really good moral decision in these cases right. too, whether or not they're Catholic. You know? Yeah. Now, Bishop McGratton, um, one of the concerns for proponents of medical assistance in dying is that um, that they might not be able to give consent, later consent, because they might have lost their faculties. What uh, what would the church say to them? Well, this is uh, the other concern that we have with these amendments, as Dr. Moira McQueen pointed out, that people can actually uh, have an advanced directive. 
And so there is not this need to give consent at the immediate time of requesting medical assistance in dying or allowing for a period for a person to have true freedom uh, to not be coerced to make that decision. So it is very troubling that in some ways our society is restricting the freedom by not having access to health care, by having these long wait times, uh, by people seeing what's happened in long-term care during COVID, people are feeling so restricted and not allowing themselves to really understand that these decisions do impact community and individuals. So, you know, there is a systemic issue here where the government itself is making a utilitarian decision that medical assistance in dying should be made more accessible than adequate health care, psychiatric care, palliative care, and where this accessibility is not equal across Canada. So I find it very <clears throat> troubling that they're providing one solution and not allowing for the freedom of choice or the ability for individuals to seek the necessary care they need that respects their dignity. Yeah. This becomes the issue for me as well. Yeah, and on, I, again, that the the contradiction that on one side they're they're saying that it's because of choice, but really, if I if I don't have access to palliative care or psychiatric care or whatever other care I need, then what choice do I really have? Um, Dr. McQueen, I just wanted to quickly go through because you, you mentioned one other safeguard that might be removed, and that is the the need for two doctors or two witnesses. Um, yeah. to, 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 I guess they have to agree that this is the only recourse and that is being removed. Can you explain that? Yeah, that, this again, well, legally, it seems very strange to me that, uh, so now it's only going to take one doctor to uh, assess the person to decide whether the person is eligible and uh, one position at the end. I think in fact, the wording is that it may not even need to be a position. But even the fact that it's reduced from, again, that, le that legal safeguard, regardless of what I might think of the action, but there's a legal safeguard of there being two witnesses that gives the action of the person, the choice of the person, some kind of uh, independence, some, some merit to one person. And I I'm not entirely sure why, I haven't seen an explanation of why they're making that reduction, uh, because it doesn't seem to be something that's absolutely necessary, and yet it, it's taking away something that I thought was very dear to the legal profession. So mm -hmm. quite apart from the legalities, just the idea again, that if there's only one person uh, signing, and especially at the, in some situations when it is an advanced directive, as Bishop McGrathen said, and then the person isn't capable at the mm -hmm. end of consenting, that you're relying on that uh, documents or words of the person attested to by one person at the beginning. It yeah. seems to me a very, very fragile way of witnessing to something as momentous as somebody having their life ended. Yeah, something irrevocable. I've actually heard proponents of medical assistance in dying uh, express concern about that particular safeguard being removed. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, Bishop McGratton, it's not just Christians or the Catholic Church or the Catholic bishops that are objecting to this. Can you tell us a little bit more about what other um, groups um, are, are, have expressed concern about this, uh, these proposed changes? Yeah, um, I don't know if you remember, but the government had a two-week um, survey where they invited uh, uh, Canadians mm -hmm. to voice their opinion. But uh, many of our faith leaders, uh, ourselves included, as the Catholic Conference of Bishops, um, many other interfaith groups, uh, such as the rabbis, the uh, um, Canadian Council of Imams, uh, the Anglican Bishop, we uh, came together as a coalition and wrote a letter uh, entitled, uh, We Can Do Better and We Must. And so it was a coalition to point out that we are very concerned about the fragility that we've been talking about of, of certain individuals in our society that might find themselves in vulnerable situations and having no other choice but made. And so from a faith tradition and religious um, beliefs, we feel it's important for, to us, for us to make that voice known, just not the Catholic voice, but the Christian, the religious voice of Canada. Mm -hmm. The other aspect is, as we mentioned, is that uh, many doctors and legal profession 
as Dr. Moira McQueen has pointed out, are also very concerned about the um, uh, amendments that are being suggested. So I think it's a sign of unity. Uh, I think it's a sign of concern for the Catholic or for the uh, Canadian society. And so I, I'm very proud of the fact that we can work together as religious and faith traditions to make such a statement. Mm -hmm. The other point is, is that uh, religion does have uh, a legitimate voice to make its, its voice known, to point out the truth and not to be marginalized. And so I think this is another sign of us as Canadians and people of belief coming together and making our voice known. Mm -hmm. That's where I think that this document has been quite helpful because two weeks of consultation on such a serious issue is just ridiculous. It, it's very much troubling and should be troubling to our Canadian citizens. And I think we want to make this known. Yeah. And I think we're speaking out for the most vulnerable, those with disabilities, those with chronic illness, all of the individuals that truly have dignity in our, our society. And mm -hmm. we as Christians need to speak out for them. And I hope that this is one way that we can do it. Yeah, um, and I'm glad you mentioned the, those groups, the, the most vulnerable. They're the ones that are more at risk, and and, it's, and and they're also speaking out. I know the disability advocates have also been very vocal about objecting to some of these proposed changes. I think that we understand what the pastoral response would be to this. What alternatives to MAID, to medical assistance in dying, do we have in Canada? You mentioned palliative care. Should we be pushing the government to put more funding into palliative care? Pushing? I, I, wish, I wish we would push harder. I, I, to me, again, people have been talking about the need for palliative care for at least 20 years, probably before that, but certainly it's become you know, really something that's become clearer to people. But Senator Carstairs, I think, did Canada a yes. really great service when she did that survey and showed that just, you know, something like 30% of Canadians can actually access palliative care when they need it. Mm -hmm. That was in 2006. And she yeah. had another go at that four or five years later. And then our legislation for euthanasia came along. So we can't say that governments didn't know or governments don't know about the questions of access. Right. So that really speaks volumes to me about the intent uh, sort of not to really be going to any great lengths to provide palliative care. And so it seems to me that this then must come back to the populace, uh, that push that you mentioned for palliative care. I, I really think it's so essential. And even if euthanasia were not uh, legal, I again, People like Senator Carstairs were advocating for it because it's a hum it really is a human need. I really prefer that word to a human right. It is a right at one level, but it's a, hum a human need. And it's so within our capacity to provide it. I mean, it's, it's always a question of money in healthcare. I understand that and there are priorities. But this is something, I mean, everybody dies, obviously, so it's not like an illness in that sense. So it's something that just about everybody could be looking forward to and would have need of, and more especially would want. People have done it in other countries. There is wonderful palliative care that's more available at home. It doesn't have to be the costly that uh, expenditure that sometimes governments put that figure on it. It can be if it's in some places, but there are other ways of doing it. I've heard from some doctors that if these changes were to go through, it would make Canada the world leader in administering death around the world. And wouldn't it be great if we became the world leaders in giving palliative care and care, uh, medical assistance in living instead of medical assistance in dying? I want to ask you both, in, in your different professions, if you've have come across people who have had to make these choices, um, and if you want to feel comfortable sharing some of those stories, well, um, for myself, uh, Pedro, I, I can honestly say, looking back and being there at the time of uh, the death of my father, um, I now see that uh, it was really a form of community palliative care. Uh, he remained in the home. Uh, he had uh, cancer, but freely chose uh, not to receive uh, for various reasons, but he lived uh, for about two and a half, three years. 
and uh, he was supported uh, both by faith, um, by this, the doctor. I cannot thank the doctor enough for his concern. Um, a fellow colleague of mine who I went to high school with, uh, he was extremely um, um, caring and understanding and did everything to allow for that death to be both dignified and one that was supported by family. So when I look back on it, I, I truly thank God that I was blessed to, to be there for when my father passed away, but for how he prepared for death, which was in the context of community, family, Mm -hmm. and received sufficient pain management at the end. So I did not see him suffer at all. Right. I can't thank the nurses who came into the home, uh, the doctor. So I, I have seen firsthand how palliative care and, and uh, can work so yeah. in my own life. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, maybe in closing, Dr. McQueen, what can we do? What can Canadians do? What can Christians in Canada do? Uh, as a response to, to what's happening? Well, I think there are several things. I, I think one of the first ones is that we become more aware of proposed legislation, what it involves. Uh, very often people don't want to know about that sort of thing. They don't look at it in any great detail. They're really surprised years later when they see the safeguards have been swept away, that kind of thing mm -hmm. that other people would have reasonably foreseen. Uh, people, we really do need to pray we talk about being small p political, that all of us have to talk to our MPs and are sometimes in our provincial MPPs as well, depending on the situation, both to be against legislation, but also to propose positive palliative care. So there's that, that political involvement that so many people think we're sort of not supposed to do mm -hmm. is, I, I think, is something that we need to dispel that attitude. The bishops lead the way in, in writing letters to government, that kind of thing. We do at CCBI. Many groups do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I guess to continue caring for each other. And I love that you said that the bishops lead the way and we follow. So um, I want to thank Bishop McGratton and all of our Canadian bishops for, for leading the way. Thank you, Bishop McGratton, for being with us today, and Dr. Moira McQueen for uh, helping us understand the situation a little better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for, for watching. As both Dr. McQueen and Bishop McGratton said, you can find out more about what's happening in very many places, but I would advise that you go to the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, visit their website, cccb.ca, and then you can also continue visiting our website, saltandlighttv.org, for more videos and articles on this topic. I'm sure that we'll continue hearing more as the issue develops. Thank you for being with us. Um, until next time, God bless.